or Bob, maybe you can let Sarah Best know if you're going to do regional schools first or second so that she um, knows whether she can just listen in for the first or second part. We'll do, we'll do regional schools first. Okay. Um, and um, so uh, I'm calling the meeting of the finance committee uh, to order uh, at 2.03 p.m. my time. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, we are holding this uh, remotely uh, per various actions of the Massachusetts legislature. And so I need to just call upon uh, each of the committee members to make sure uh, they can be heard and I, we can hear them. Andy? Yes, I'm here. Kathy? Yes. Bernie? Here. Councilor Haneke? Present. Councilor Walker? Here. Okay, we're all present. Um, I know Matt is not available today, so this is the committee as we have it. Um, I think I'm gonna hold off on public comments until after the, the uh, review of the two budgets, because I think uh, I, I value Doug's time and, and uh, Sarah Bess's time. And so I, you know, we can hold off on, on commenting. Um, just for those of you in the uh, audience, um, we will not be voting uh, to, uh, on either of these proposals today. Um, we uh, will vote uh, at the end of our review of the budget the way we do all the time. So just so people are, if, if you're waiting for a vote, uh, we're not going to do that today. So, um, so uh, I guess Kathy, you have the lead on on these. So why don't you uh, begin? Um, thanks, Bob and Doug. Um, I'm hoping that you got sent the questions in advance. One one was a general one on where we could see the six percent budget, and for people in the public, I did discover we posted it on the um, town's website. So the first question is if we went to 6%, how would the funds be allocated? And Bob, I don't know whether you want me to walk down through that. So, you know, on regional, that's one of the questions. And the other is House and Senate bills are moving. And if some more money comes in, um, would this mean, would this offset the assessments being asked from the town? So, so do you want me to do them one at a time? I can do them either way. Um, elementary had a longer set. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, just go okay. through the questions one by one. Okay. Um, so then if, if we go to 6%, which was recommended by the school committee and its revision, how would we um, know that looking forward, um, we're going to address the structural issues or, you know, do is there a set of potentials? Um, and then we listed some that occurred to us or to people, um, you know, and including, you know, uh, addressing the actual size of the schools, re redesigning curriculum, thinking about um, not bringing in choice students, you know, trying to, to downsize the staff over time to fit the enrollment or um, whatever um, on it. If we, if um, one was more specific to the interactions with Amherst, um, right now the regional school system is taking advantage of the fact that we have crest responders, and my understanding is that's working well. DPW helps maintain the fields. Is the expectation that this will continue? Um, and right now Amherst is paying for the full cost of that. Um, can we, and this is, <laughs> um, this is uh, really with when Paul joins us, if, can, if we go to 6%, can, is this a one-time uh, increase? And is the, does the base stay at the 4%, you know? And if we wanted to do that, we realize it gets worse than in FY26 if we do that, you know, how, how what, what would be the multi-year plan if we do that? Um, I think that is 
the um, main set of questions. Mandy sent me some and I, I included hers, but I, my understanding is Shutesbury, Leverett and Pelham have now voted yes on the 6%. Does that mean the way regional budgets, does that mean we are in fact facing 6%? Is it, and Andy will know, the, is it, if three out of four have said yes, is that the budget we're now looking at, even though it's not in the town manager's budget? So I think those are the big questions that we had, um, starting okay. with, if we go to six, where's the money going? <laughs> yeah. Right. So a, a couple of things I'll sort of paint um, a, a picture about sort of how the, how the regional budget works. And so you're right in some respects that with three of the four towns voting for the operating budget um, and the capital budget, that that carries the day as far as the numbers are concerned. However, the assessment method is a critical component and all four towns must agree to that because we use a non, uh, uh, the non-statutory method. Um, so as a result, to actually have a full budget in place, it requires uh, approval of both those. So, um, uh, so Amber still has a sort of full veto right, so, as it were, um, at this point, whether you do it through not approving the assessment method, which is currently a, uh, the same uh, assessment structure we've used over the last couple of years with a change in the percentage, or if you change and vote a different uh, bottom line for the funding for the, for the district. Um, so there's that. If, if, uh, so in, in, if you were to not approve the sort of uh, the budget number, but approve the assessment method at 6%, then you'd be compelled to, you, we would have a budget because the it's a three quarters, you know, there's one town can vote against the, the budget numbers, but all towns must vote for the assessment method. So it's a little tricky, but you have to both passed um, in order to have a budget. So if, if the town either, uh, if the town rejects the assessment method, then, then the regional schools do not have a budget uh, at present. Um, so that's one piece. I think that, you know, to the question of sort of the base, um, so the assessment method drives what, you know, what the assessment is. We have traditionally in the last few years used the previous year as a starting point um, for that assessment method, but, um, and typically because budgets go up and so everybody's assessment goes up a certain amount and, and, and there's limits on what increases can be, um, what you are assessed is the sort of base. So if it is uh, approved at a 6%, that is your base number for the next year. But again, the assessment method is one that we have collectively as four communities uh, decided upon. And so uh, if we collectively decide to fund at a lower level from you know just across the board uh, for assessment to the four towns, or if you change the structure of that uh, assessment method, that could change percentages, increase or decrease from the previous year significantly. So um, but as far as a basis, uh, if the assessment method is approved by the town, then, then that, you know, that number is, is the, uh, is the basis for the coming year. Um, but then again, you know, when we sort of start putting budgets together in late November, early December, um, you know, whether you can continue to afford that or not, and what percentage increase you might be able to tolerate or not, is going to be part of that conversation. And if, you know, and this is true for any of the four towns is that, um, because we're using an alternative method, then we can change the method if we need to, uh, to meet the resources that towns have or don't have. Um, so that's uh, that's one piece. Um, there's a question about how the funds will be allocated between the middle school and high school. You know, I think we're going to determine that as we as we get closer. I mean, we're in process now. Um, you know, we'll and, and this will be the generic sort of thing I'll say about that um, is that, you know, I'm going to lean on the sort of educational professionals in the buildings to tell me what's best and to, and to, to fi figure out what's the best uh, educational implementation that we can do with the money and resources we have available for the kids. So what we restore is going to be driven by what they think has the most impact for the dollars that we have. Um, and that may, you know, that may re run counter to popular opinion, and it may also run counter to your own personal preferences. Um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna leave that in the in the hands of the administrators as as is uh, their purview. Um, as far as you know, some of the questions around uh, you know how we're looking at the future, uh, there is a sort of structural problem that we have. It pre-exists, you know, predates the ESSER monies. Um, 
And we have not in a couple of years or several years taken a, a deep and long look at, at a host of, of topics. I think our, you know, our program of studies, our staffing model, our uh, utilization of our buildings. Um, all of those are things that we need to be looking at in the next couple of years to determine uh, how best to, to reconcile the gap between what our general increase in revenue looks like versus our general increase in expenses. Our, our expenses go up four to 4.3% 4 per year. Our revenues are going up about two, 2.3 per year. Um, you know, on average, the, the towns can, as a whole, not individually, but as a whole, the towns can tolerate about a 3% increase in their assessment each year. You know, the, uh, you know, the other primary components of, of revenue for the regional schools have held pretty flat. Um, and particularly, you know, the big one is, is Chapter 70 funding. Um, that's been at a very, very low rate. So unless that has a significant influx of, of funding, uh, we're going to be in a, in a continued state of having, uh, you know, revenues flatter than, than, you know, the growth in revenues flatter than the, uh, the growth in expenses. And so we've got to find some structural things we do, whether it would be with physical, you know, use of space, um, programs, you know, program study, how much school choice we use, all those are, are things we have to explore in some way. You know, one of the questions that we haven't looked at in a, in a, in a systematic way, uh, or certainly not in a long time, is what's the program of studies we want to offer? Um, because when we, you know, when we come into, you know, a, a reduction circumstance, uh, you know, it's always difficult to re reduce things and have less of what we've offered before. And there's some, some level of, 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 analysis of what do we want to offer as a program of studies? What's the number of kids that are necessary to sustain that? Because that's a question too, is like, you know, if you have 50 kids, it's hard to sustain the same program as if you have 500 or 5,000 or, and so we have to be thoughtful about that too. And thinking about what our total number of students is, how many are we likely to attract or not attract via school choice? Um, and whether that's the right method to, to sort of fund a, uh, a particular program of study. So we have to think about all of those things kind of simultaneously and, and, and weigh them against each other and the values that we have uh, in the coming years. Um, just because the, the current track we're on is not one we're going to um, sustain for very long. With the ESSER funds, uh, you know, we've, we've, they have allowed us to not feel as much of the pain of the, you know, of inflation. Um, we've been able to sort of push that off a little bit. And now we're starting, you know, as we taper through those, those funds, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to have to address that more firsthand. Um, so the, the gap between revenue and expense is a little greater over the next, you know, in the current year. And then again, you know, next year for fiscal 25 and then 26, because we still have a little bit of, of, of that funding that's supporting the fiscal 25 budget, we'll have to, uh, resolve that as well. So we've done a few things to, to try to mitigate that we've held you know uh some some resources in our in our uh various revolving accounts like school choice and and some of those uh to try to build balances and hold that money and and use that to offset a little bit of that that uh decrease in 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 grant funding um but knowing that there's a limit to how much that can do and and there are going to be some difficult you know contractions that are necessary over the over the coming years um see if I'm missing anything off the top of my head here. Um, you know, as far as uh, assessment methods, um, like I said, you know, the assessment method is, is we use an alternate method, which requires approval by all four towns. We can do different methods. We have in past years, we've had the same one for the last couple of years. Um, we do a modified version of the statutory method. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, there, there are, and there's arguments plus or minus no, for a lot wait, of, of the, um, you know, ways we've, we've looked at, at those assessment methods and ability to pay and that sort of thing. Um, those can be, you know, revisited. So if we come into next year and it looks as though, you know, we'll be gapped in fiscal 26 by, uh, a, you know, kind of a million dollars in change it, as first, you know, at, at first blush, we, we were looking at about a 1.2 or 1.25, um, gap, um, coming into fiscal 26. So there's going to be some significant, you know, uh, adjustments we're going to need to try to make to, to stay within, uh, you know, the, the capacity of the towns to meet the, the expenses. And so we'll, we'll, um, you know, subsequent years after next year will be more moderate, um, as far as that gap, but it's still going to be a gap and we need to think about it more, uh, profoundly and more, uh, proactively as we, as we move ahead. So we definitely do that. Um, 
There's a couple of questions here about shared staff. Yes, uh, Cress has been fortunate. We've been uh, a little shorthanded in our middle school in particular around you know certain things like arrivals and lunch. And so our friends at Crest were able to provide us some support during the second half of the year to, to help us. I don't necessarily expect us to need that support next year. I mean, we love having them in. It's a great opportunity for the Crest program to kind of integrate with our, our staff. Um, you know, we would hope that next year as we uh, staff the building, we, we wouldn't be in that that place, you know, having our, our admin structure the way it was this year and, and changing has made it difficult to cover that as well as we'd like to. Um, I think for the other kinds of shared work that we do, like the DBW, um, we've had a pretty good cooperative arrangement with the town. Um, there are ways in which they, you know, share staff and effort uh, on our behalf. And, and likewise, it goes the other way as far as use of fields and, and, uh, and you know, uh, what we charge or don't charge for some of those, some of those um, usages. So we, we try to strike a balance there. But again, if, if you know, we're going to go through a process of a, a a deep analysis of, of all sorts of things. And I think as we bring uh, this track and fields project forward and it, it kind of shifts some of what we need to do relative to our those field use, we're gonna have to look more closely and, and perhaps more precisely at, at how we're sharing uh, staff and resources with the town to be fair to, to both parties. You know, we've generally felt it was a pretty good arrangement for both parties, but you know, it, it is things change. We need to kind of reevaluate that and, and rethink that and, and analyze it again. And, and that's both from the standpoint of, of um, uh, you know, field use exterior, but also building use and that sort of thing by the town. So we try to be you know, thoughtful in that process and we'll continue to be as we move ahead. Um, I think I hit most of the points. Um, I will, there's one question here just about the increase for, for on a per pupil basis. Uh, both the houses said it had $104 uh, per pupil. That adds about 90,000 to the regional budget. Um, in the House Ways and Means budget though, because they reduced rural school aid, um, which is a, a form of funding that's been recent uh, in, in recent budgets, they reduced that from 15 million down to seven and a half. That difference um, kind of washes out a good part of that, uh, of that 90,000 increase. So the House Ways and Means wasn't necessarily a plus for the regional schools. Um, in the in the Senate budget, it was um, you know they they sort of I don't want to say fully funded they funded the 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 regional school aid at the same level as the current year, and they also increased to one hundred four. So there'd be about a ninety thousand dollar increase. In general, what happens when we do our budgets is we make guesstimates of what you know we have like for any of our revenue, whether it be transportation reimbursement or 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 uh, Chapter seventy. Um, Anything that comes in above uh, projection uh, is is um, you know is generally not you know discounted in the assessment to the the towns. Um, and what happens is if that revenue, you know, because some of the revenue doesn't come in it as expected, so it goes both ways, right? So we have um, when we net out at the end of the year, any additional revenues and you know ahead of expense end up being in our END, which is like reserved for the town, but we're limited by a. a you know, a 5% of our operating budget uh, in totality of, of how much we can have. And so if we get above that, then um, we are compelled to to make adjustment. And that's either uh, discounting assessments or, or something of that sort that we have to do. That happened to us a couple of years ago. Um, our END got above that 5% threshold and we reduced the assessment during that fiscal year. I want to say it was fiscal 22. Um, I could be mistaken on that. So it's kind of a lagging benefit to the towns when that happens, but um, we do have, you know, some boundaries on how much we can, we can sort of stockpile as it were. Um, they don't let us sort of accumulate each of the member towns money forever. We, we can do it to a certain point, but then they're, they're, you know, they do compel us to spend it in some form. Um, so I think I'll pause there and see if there's other things that kind of that I either missed or, or that you want some more specific answers I too. I think you responded to the main ones. Um, you know, I consolidated in some Mandy sent to me, so she may want to follow up. I have one that crosses over with elementary, so I'll just state it and then we can come back to it after Mandy does. If it, it, It's looking into the future. Assuming since the sixth grade moves up, if you had your ideal how the sixth grade would be then integrated into the middle school, does that help with FY26? So 
you know, for example, if the sixth graders were taking language programs, music, art, um, sharing some of it in terms of staffing. And I don't need you to answer that right now, but I want to come back to it when we do elementary because there's uh, trying to think in a things that might be helpful um, on the stress of the FY26 budget. Mandy, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ending. Bob, you're the chair. No, that's so okay. Go ahead, Councilor Handicke. <laughs> I didn't know whether uh, the superintendent <laughs> wanted to address that before I asked my question, but um, I can if you'd like. It's uh, fine if you want to. Okay, I'll I'll just say this. Um, so it'll it'll be fiscal twenty seven before we move the kids to the, the sixth graders <clears throat> to the middle school. So that's a little bit. Um, it will be a you know a small benefit to the region. I think it it has. Um, there's opportunities for some sort of sh some shared staffing and some economies that way, not as many as we'd like in some respects, but some. Um, and I think then there'll be, you know, a, a small or moderate, um, you know, sort of rental or lease agreement we'll need to have with the region uh, that will need to be paid. So I think that will be beneficial. Um, you know, we're going to try to leverage and be as, uh, as effective and, and, and conscientious cost wise as we can uh, with that. But there are some limits based on the fact that they'll still remain two different districts and and so there won't be quite as many savings as might be presumed um but it will help the region a little bit it'll be some expense for the for for amherst but there's you know another sort of bigger thing going on a couple of things over there that are going to probably save some some revenue so you know the amherst side's got a a few more opportunities for some economies as we go over the next few years with with building changes and and staffing changes associated with those as you, talk, as you talk i get other questions um I, I i don't know where to start but um i'll start with a question that popped up as you were talking about the sixth grade move is that move potentially preventing um the region from considering all options for addressing a structural deficit uh including particularly potentially closing the middle school and combining seven to 12 all into the high school um that possibly would go in with you know i know there was a determination that at this point seven to 12 doesn't fit in the high school but if you started removing choice students that might change i don't know whether it does but it's probably something that should be on the table and does a sixth grade does the current sixth grade plan prevent that from being considered um so that's question number one um i have a couple but i'll ask one other one and then i'll let others ask um you say the budget's adopted, but the assessment method is not. Um, if Amherst says no to both the budget and the assessment method, does the budget stay adopted with an assessment method that defaults to the state default assessment method? And if so, what are those numbers? So um, <clears throat> I'll answer them in order. So uh, as far as the sixth grade, you know, in, in considerations, you know, I think we it's early to tell, but I don't think so as far as the sixth grade move. And and we'd, we'd factor that into the sort of calculus of all of it. Um, the the thing about sort of shuttering a building is you have to, you know, it's a huge capital asset. So there's some level of of, of uh, value there that you're wanting, wanting to maintain and preserve. So there's some investment you have to make. And, and the hardest thing on a building is to be completely unoccupied. Um, uh, it, it just, you don't attend to things. And so it's, it's a much, much, riskier uh and and more difficult to maintain your capital asset if, if you don't have some people in it so i think there's there's a variety of ways to think about that and and i don't think uh the six trade move prevents us from thinking broadly and deeply about seven through 12 and i think we we will have to revisit how those uh, how they fit together and what makes the most sense in that regard um and i think there are a number of options to explore so i think there's a lot of things to consider but no real clarity and i don't think anything's ruled out as a result of that on the second question, uh, with regard to the, um, the the sort of budget passed versus and and the assessment method, my understanding is that if you if you don't pass the assessment method, you don't have a budget. I mean, as much as the sort of numbers might have been agreed to by three of the four towns, you, if you don't have a budget, you don't have a budget, and so you fall into a circumstance with the state where if you don't get that resolved before the end of June, then they they have a particular 
prescribed methodology that they use uh, to, to walk you know, districts through that. Um, so I think that there's, there's not really, um, we don't get held to that set of numbers. Um, we really kind of, you know, if we, if we fail the budget, we, we have to come back to, to the four towns and the school committee and come to a number that we can agree to and a, an assessment method that, that can fund that number. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, it's not to say we're completely at ground zero, but we can be, it can be a very, very different conversation, but I think we're, whether it's, um, but, but you don't hold the, the sort of numerics and then find an assessment method that fits. I don't believe that's the case. I think you're sort of without a budget and, and both have to be agreed to by, by the communities to, to get to a budget. Um, the thing that happens if we get into July is um, <clears throat> if we don't have a formally adopted budget at that point, the state does step in, the commissioner uh, starts to do what's called a 112 budget. They, by default, uh, use the statutory method for, um, for assessing the towns. Uh, how much is an interesting question because they'll often lean on the previous fiscal year, but there's nothing that prevents the, the commissioner from picking any number that uh, he wants. Um, so sometimes they may, um, you know, they may pick a number that, that is a little higher than the previous year just because they know you have a series of expenses right at the beginning of the fiscal year. There's a whole host of choices that, that they'll go through in that process. Um, <clears throat> The thing to keep in mind is you get assessed. And so in the statutory method, Amherst's percentage of the total assessment, you know, goes down about a percentage point or so from where it is right now. Um, it has a much more profound effect on, on the other towns. The thing to keep in mind is that once we then resolve to a budget, um, you know, payments today, you know, it, it's as if the, the process had not occurred. Um, so all payments to date are counted and then what you're assessed is still based on that ultimate assessment that you as a four, you know, four town uh, regional dis district agreed to. So they sort of re-square the books back to the agreement once you get to an agreement. Um, it's only if you get about six months in, the state decides that they're just gonna tell you what to do that, that you get into uh, a statutory method that holds for the full fiscal year. Any, anything that happens before then um, is really more about, um, you know, the state dictating and uh, leaning more heavily on the, on the four towns to come to some resolution and the cash flow problems it might cause because it shifts, you know, the sort of uh, burden a bit more to one town versus another. Um, but if you resolve, then it then it sort of squares it up back to 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 a um, as if it were to have happened in June. So um, the the agreement that the towns come to, whether it happens now or it happens a couple of months from now, prevails in the totality of the budget for fiscal 25. So as you negotiate and have that conversation about what the assessment should be and what the total funding level should be and all of that with the four towns, um, you should think of it as, you know, as if you were having that conversation in March or in, in February. Doug, I wanted to follow up on, on one uh, thing you, I think, I believe you stated that um, under the 6% budget, you haven't decided specific changes to curriculum or to teaching staff. Is that correct? Uh, I'd say we're in process. I mean, I think that, you know, they're working through schedules as best they can. Um, you know, they're working from a most restrictive place and then sort of where are the highest pain points, which are the things if we get some funding, um, have the greatest impact um, or have the greatest need. Um, so they're in that process, um, had some preliminary conversations with some of the building administrators about that, but but they're still, you know, still working through that process. Um, there's some things that, that they suggested to, to reduce that are much easier to, to, to hold true to. Um, uh, so, so I think that, uh, you know, the, the list of things that, that I think we got and we shared out with you guys, um, uh, is still the sort of, you know, working list of, of ideas there. Um, and then, you know, they'll restore as much of that as is possible with the funding level that's available. And it, are there any constraints in terms of notification of teaching staff and, and, and other things that, you know, you kind of run up against a, a hard stop? 
Yeah, for, for our teaching staff in particular, we have a uh, April 15th deadline um, for notification about your continued employment with the district. And so we took a conservative approach at that point because we didn't know where, where it was going to land. So we presumed um, all of the reductions to get to a 4% increase for Amherst, Leverett, mm -hmm. Shootsbury, and a two and a half or so percent for, for Shoots, I mean, 4% for Amherst, Pelham, and Leverett, about a two and a half percent increase for, for Shootsbury. So we, we notified people of the potential of their not having employment back in April. Um, some of our others, it's, it's a June one date. Um, but again, we will, we'll use the same sort of modality with that if we're not settled by June one. Um, so we've indicated that to folks and, and it's difficult because they're sitting in a place where, well, maybe I'll have it, maybe I won't. So they have to make the best decision for them personally. Um, and that's a tough, tough place to sit. Yeah, oh, I agree. Thanks. Uh, Bernie. Uh, just, Mandy, are you finished with your line of questioning? Um, you can go on Bernie. And I'll oh, come back you. with some different questions. Okay. I, I sent some questions in, and uh, Doug, I have no idea if you, you've had a chance to look at them or not. Um, but it was, I looked at the DESE profiles for uh, the regional school and for where uh, in the Amherst school. And on the Amherst Pelham, it indicates, DESE indicated that 23 teachers were hired in 22 and 23, and 13 paraprofessionals. So the question, I'll have a similar question when we get to the elementary schools, is how many of these hires were to manage staff turnover um, and how many were new additions? And were the additions to the, first off, I should say, I'm presuming these are accurate. <laughs> uh, how many of these hires were, were to manage staff turnover? How many of them were new positions? And were the new positions all paid out of ESSER funds? So I didn't get a chance to kind of dig into it too, too much. I did see the question. Um, I will say that that um, most will be replacement of staff that have left. So it's about staffing churn. You know, folks retire. Um, uh, they get employment somewhere else. They leave us. Um, that kind of thing. So most of it's that. Uh, there were probably some that, that were particular to... Um, uh, needs to be requirements of an IEP. Um, so we may have had to add some new staff to, to meet the, the needs of an IEP, particularly in the paraprofessional range. That's probably more likely there if we have kids that have uh, one to one uh, paraprofessional support. Um, sometimes we add staff to, to meet that, and, and that's dictated by their, their, uh, their IEP. Um, the ones that we added in 22, there were some of those that were probably funded with, with ESSER funds. We tried to sort of carve that back uh, last year and this year um, to, to not explicitly fund them from ESSER. Um, and yet in some ways, indirectly, we're still funding them from ESSER because we're using ESSER to generally support the budget a little bit. So, you know, there is some of that. Um, but I would say the overall, you know, sort of change there is, is mostly just turnover and staff and a small amount is is related to to some added staff, um, either by virtue of IEP needs or or uh, some ads we made in a targeted way to to support the schools generally around generally around pandemic related work. Yeah, I just I'll say as an aside that I did take a look at the uh, selected populations profiles that Desi publishes, and um, we are under the state averages in every category except. Um, special needs students where we're about 20% um, over what the state average is. Unfortunately, Desi mushes all these up into, uh, uh, and I, I did not have the time or the, the, the effort, or I was willing to make the effort to tease out um, elementary from secondary and secondary schools from technical schools and everything else. I, I just didn't do that. Uh, the other question I have for you, um, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying when when I uh, I had the opportunity to work on contracts for contracts, teachers and others, I uh, worked with uh, a, a exceptionally good attorney um, who really made the point that when you negotiate a labor agreement, you're not negotiating a three-year labor agreement. You're looking at six years out, possibly nine years out. Um, given that, how does, and you, you hinted at some of this, I think, in um, in the regional meeting, um, how does the changing age 
credentials and experience levels of the staff, of the new staff that's been hired, uh, impact the current and future contract costs? Yeah, I think that what, what I've noticed, so I'll just paint a little bit of a history lesson here. So when I first started working for the district um, over 15 years ago, uh, when we looked at our our um, our staffing, we have a grade and step system. So, you know, there's different grades for in, in teaching, for example, it's based on education level, but in others, it depends on the sort of work you do. But then there's steps. So you come in at a lower step and then you work your way up to a maximum step. And so um, when I first came in, the number of folks that were at the top step, so sort of maxed out and in a year over year basis, were only getting cost of living increases was at about just shy of 70% of the staff were at the top step. Right now we're, we're just under 50 or right at 50%. Um, so that puts a greater inflationary pressure on you year over year. And what, what you have with, with staff that are not at the top step is there's the COLA, the cost of living increase, plus the step. And the steps vary depending on contracts, but, but they're usually... Um, just waiting for the bell to finish ringing, sorry. Uh, they're usually in the order of about three to 4% in most, most of our contracts. Um, so, you know, for a person that's getting a step and a COLA, their increase from one year to the next could be five, 6% relative to their previous year. And so when you get younger, uh, you, you know, there's a greater inflationary pressure. And we're in that place right now, I think with, with the sort of baby boomer uh, generation sort of mostly retired at this point, we're going to probably hold steady in that range because I think the, the sort of churn of, of staff is going to be such that we, we kind of hold uh, in that, in that mode of, of not as many people at the top end. And, and so I think that that inflationary pressure of, of a great set system is going to be greater over the coming years. Um, we did some work on looking at that a little bit, uh, across, uh, across our, our, all of our contracts. You know, if we have similar increases, cost of living increases as to what we've had in the most recent contracts that, puts the just general overall pressure on, on, um, uh, on our labor costs at about 4.3% per year uh, with steps and colas. Um, you know, if we negotiate smaller colas, that goes down a little bit. Um, but, you know, given that, you know, people are, and this is true for both Amherst as well as the region, you know, people are 80 to 85% of our costs and most of that is salaries, you know, that's a pretty strong driver of, of what's going on. Um, so ways we can be more efficient with our staffing, ways we can think about our contracts in different ways to, to reduce that inflationary pressure are going to be critical steps as we move forward. Um, and I don't think, you know, I don't think any district, I mean, a lot of districts are in the same place, you know, because the nature and structure of the, the workforce has changed. So I think that there's a lot of districts that are going to have to look deeply at their at their contracts and see if there's ways they can structure them differently in future years. And that's a that's a tough thing. Because you know some of the mechanisms and modalities of these contracts are very, very entrenched, understandably. Yeah, it's difficult. Was there um, um, uh, without getting too deep into negotiating tactics? So I'm assuming um, the, uh, the the steps were looked at in terms of how how steep and how uh, frequent the steps are. And I was also wondering if there's any was any thought given to separating out steps and cola. So that people might get a, who are eligible for a step raise or get a step raise one year call the next and the people who are no longer eligible for um, step increases would simply get a cola every year. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm, personally, I'm open to every idea anybody has. We're going to head into contract negotiations for for um, four of our contracts uh, this year, this coming year. So for fiscal 26. Um and so as a result, we're, we're going to, we have two that are, we're trying to finish up now. And those are much, much smaller groups of folks. So just there's six total that we deal with in, you know, three are, are under the large umbrella of APEA. And that's the largest one with those three different units in it. Um, so we have four of the six that we're, we're going to negotiate this coming year and any and all ideas that folks have around that to, to mitigate or, or moderate those inflationary pressures, um, I'm happy to hear about them. So thank you for that. And, and if anybody has other ideas, I want to hear those as well. <laughs> well yeah, I, I mean, it, yes. As a former state employee, my 3% COLA is on the uh, an imaginary $16,000 base. So I try not to spend all $360 at once when I get the COLA. So, uh, you know, right. it's one of those, one of those things. Um, 
So, Bernie, I, did you have a follow up? I'm, I'm all set. Thank you. I, I appreciate Doug's response. Uh, Councilor Haneke? Um, if Bridget's trying to respond to Bernie's questions, Bridget oh, can go Bridget, first. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, I wanted to just say one thing sort of broadly, which is when we look at other towns, especially in the region, I know I read in the paper this morning, Northampton's looking for 8 million. I think I just want to like mention within the tone that with the resources we have, I mean, I'm imagining that we're doing a pretty good job that we're not looking Belcher Town just past 1.2. I mean, I'm not sure, obviously there are definitely places to save, but um, to answer the questions, I looked at those three-year trends as, um, in terms of um, teacher ratios to see because there have been a lot of discussion about the decline in enrollment and how that aligns. And in 2020, 2021 school year, we had 1,283 students and 115.5 teachers. And for 23-24, we had um, 1,210 teachers, I mean, sorry, 1,210 students <laughs> and 109 teachers. So we're down 6.5 teachers and we're down about 73 students. So yeah. I think that and, aligns. Yeah, and, and again, using the DESI numbers, uh, yeah, which mush everything together, the state average is 11.9 uh, uh, students to one teacher. Uh, Amherst, uh, Amherst as a whole, or Amherst Pelham is uh, uh, 11.4. So that's not a huge difference. Uh, it's about a 4% difference in terms of uh, in terms of FTEs per student. So um, this is one of the puzzles when you're looking at at how to manage these budgets more effectively. Is 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 you know what what's driving it, and um, it, you know it's it's a mystery to me. Right. And the really last thing I wanted to say was just in relation to what positions our school committee was pretty clear that we want to preserve as many of those positions close to the classroom as possible. And for in terms of the teaching teacher notices that were sent, you can go to Doug's presentation and he's got them all listed out there, but there's four middle school world language teachers who got notices, a guidance counselor, the restorative person at the middle and high school an adjustment counselor and AP bio and AP math folks at the high school. I'm sure there's other things you can go for the specifics. It's in Doug's presentation that he's put forward, but those people will have to be the ones cut just by the notice deadlines and the contracts if we don't go up with the budget. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um a couple other questions. You mentioned E and D, and if it gets too high, it needs to be returned to the towns. With modified assessment methods, including all of these guardrails that have been going on, how is it determined the percentage that each town gets back out of the amount that is being turned? Is it, it how, how is that determined is question number one. Is it based on the last year's assessment percentage, or is it some other thing? Um, question number two, thank you for answering about the crest responders and maintenance and all. I'm curious whether it's usual for a host town of a regional district to incur these types of general personnel and operating costs as opposed to emergency costs, like when a fire alarm goes off and the host school has to respond, the, the fire department has to respond um, outside of a region budget. Um, and without the cost contribution of cost sharing from the other towns in the region because it's being incurred under the host town's operating budget and not the region's operating budget. And my third one is um, potentially more for our school committee, regional school committee members that are here. What has the school committee and the administration actually done to put in place now um, or in the next month or two um, to start really looking at and all the changes that need done because of the structural issue with the regional school. What What's going on now? Um, because we have less than a year to find solutions because as, as the superintendent said, even if um, the school regional school budget is adopted by all four towns, next year is just as bad. Um, and And we can't be here again with nothing having happened like we are this year 
compared to last year where we said the same thing, we can't be here with nothing having happened. Um, so what, what have you all done since April or March when this really became your concern and said, we'll, we'll be back with a plan next year. What have you done to start with that? So if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer the other two sort of first. Um, so on the assessment and the return of the assessment, they use the current year. So since you are, are, um, essentially giving credit back to the towns, uh, in a current fiscal year, you use the assessment method that's in place or the percentages based on the current year assessment method. Um, uh, that's sort of the best, you know, the, the reality is, is some of those dollars are maybe from three or four years ago, and then some of those dollars are from the current year. So they just use the most recent year's assessment method as far as discounting uh, is concerned. And, it, and it's one of those things we work hand in hand with Desi when they sort of say, hey, wait, you've got too much money, you got to give it back. Um, there are other options, though, too. You can, um, you know, commit to spending it. Um, and and if you if you do it early enough, you can you can do it, which we do every year anyway, to some extent. We budget some of our END for budget support, so you can do that. You can you can spend it on capital items. So if you if you end at that five percent range, there's a few ways to sort of solve the overage problem. One is one is to discount uh, assessments uh, in the current fiscal year, and then of course there's other um, ways to dedicate it to to other spending. Um, so that's one piece. I think as far as the host town and and how much you know sort of. Um, I want to say off the books, but sort of not expressly, you know, quantified uh, services happen. I, you know, I think it depends. I think there's a whole host of, of ways that that host towns, you know, provide, you know, those sort of active or, or passive uh, supports to their regional schools. You know, um, you know, we routinely have you know programming between our our Amherst police staff and our and our students uh, or the Crest program and our students and and you know yeah there's police staff in you know Pelham Leverett Shutesbury we tap into those folks there's you know a lot of cooperative and regional agreements between those towns as well where we share that uh, same with fire coverage um, so you know there there are ways uh, you know. Uh, I think the, the balancing act is is what does it cost to do the accounting versus what is the, the benefit? Sometimes the, you know, sort of doing the paperwork to sort out what to charge or not charge is more expensive than, than just agreeing to it. But I think that, you know, we're, we're in a place, especially to do a deep dive, like I think we're, we're, we're needing to do currently, we've got to look at that uh, and see and, and make sure we're being fair, um, you know, as far as, you know, what we're asking the town of Amherst to carry on some of those, those kind of things. I think in the totality of either budget, whether it be the town of Amherst budget or the regional schools budget, I don't think it's huge dollars. At the same time, it's not zero, and and taking a look at it's you know fair. Andy, did you want to go? Because Sarah Bess and Bridget have comments too. No, well, you can let them go ahead. I'm going to raise a slightly different subject. So, I... okay, Sarah Bess. Thank you. Um... So I can tell you uh, what I have done in the past little bit. Uh, we obviously have another meeting tonight where uh, our FY25 budget will be a reoccurring agenda item probably from now until it is all settled. And then we'll talk about FY26 budget from forever. Um, so I personally have uh, spoken with several uh, senators and representatives. Um, I can give you my list. Where did they go? Um, uh, Representative Patricia Duffy, uh, Joe Comerford's office, Jason Lewis, Chief, Chief of Staff, Ian O'Neill, who's the Education Analysis for the Senate Ways and Means Committee, uh, someone from Senator Paul Mark's office, and today even I spoke with Representative Dan Carey. Um, MASC has created a rural uh, focused school committee, um, which I have joined to advocate for uh, helping to increase funding to our, you know, rural schools. Um, and I have even uh, spoken with the town council, um, a, a town councilor about helping, starting to create a larger working group uh, and other with, you know, Amherst and the, re you know, the regional schools um, and other towns to uh, really Kind of dive deep into seeing what what can be done and what's our best path forward. 
Um, and we are, you know, working on negotiating our superintendent contract, which we are hoping to wrap up very shortly. So all of those things are good progress towards things that are happening right now to try and, you know, help mitigate for the next year. Thank you. Uh, Bridget? Yeah, thanks, Sarah Best. She, Sarah Best mentioned a lot of what I was thinking about, but um, in terms of we sent several representatives down to the day on the hill to work at the state level as well. And I know a fellow school committee was in touch um, or is getting in touch this week about trying to get money for the middle school roof. Um, I myself reached out to the town manager about ideas for capital projects that could reduce our operating co costs. One that increased our operating costs a lot was just when the town got rid of the trash truck. And so we absorbed just a whole teacher salary worth of um, outsourcing costs for the track, trash alone. So um, those are some of the things. Tonight we have a budget meeting and one thing that we were talking about where I was thinking about doing is just to propose a year round committee. So we've got a subcommittee working on the budget year round because when I came in, it seems like it's a season of just January to April, and that's not enough or deep enough. And then I think there's a piece where, as an Amherst resident, I also want to look to my town and talk to the co colleagues in town, because um, Herb Robes was sending me some data about how the percent of the town budget that's gone to the schools has gone down several years consecutively as well. And I know our neighboring towns spend more of their overall percent of operating on the schools. And I think we have to have a discussion about whether we want to keep you know, going down in both areas for the schools or whether, you know, whether that's because we're raising in other areas for the town. You guys probably know the ins and outs of that better than I do, but I think there's choices being made at the state and at the town's level that do impact on what's going on in the schools and and um, most people want roads and schools first, you know, as town residents. So um, those are just things I'd say keep top of the mind. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, all that has been said. And I was, have been dealing with this for a long time. And there are structural problems with fund, how we fund schools in Massachusetts. And uh, some of that goes back to the fact that it comes back to the towns. The, the towns are supporting and towns are limited by Proposition 2.5. And 2.5 and was chosen by the sponsors back in the late 70s, 1980, when it was uh, finally passed to try and actually force the towns to um, end up cutting because they were they picked a number that over the long haul was not going to um, carry to inflation. And so I think we're seeing that now. Uh, and it really does call for fundamental change and that may require legislative action. I don't um, expect that the legislative action is going to be to make a major enough change in the budget or the budget methodology that is going to really save the day. The other thing I was uh, interested in, and Bridget, you and I should have a conversation about this offline some other time, but uh, we've always uh, been very careful to make sure that the percentage increase that is going for operating budgets gets divided equally amongst um, municipal programs across the board. So that while we may give some more to a town department than another, the municipal departments, the regional schools, local schools and library have been in lockstep all the way along. And that's what um, part of the philosophical question is, is, uh, um, this year, um, it's being asked to do something that we haven't done before. And the only other very made significant variable is the um, um, amount that goes for capital. And 
capital actually supports all segments of the budget because the 10.5% that goes to capital under the current arrangement also covers any capital expenditures that we get taxed um, for from the regional schools. So I'm not sure how the figures that you came up with um, mesh with how the budget or why it's working that way. I just sort of, so sometime offline, we should have that conversation and see if we can figure it out together. My question though, that I, the reason I raised my hand is, is that I, um, you also had indicated in an earlier comment, you made more reference to all of the other towns that are in similar crisis. We are not alone and we know that because we all read the same newspapers. And um, have we had any discussions with other towns um, uh, um, as far as things that we might do together to gain efficiencies by cooperative programming or, or other methodologies that uh, will enable us to become um, more efficient in how we um, are doing what we do and providing high quality education. So I can give a little bit of an answer to that question. Um, so we are a member of the, um, thank you, sorry, um, the Hampshire Educational Collaborative, um, which the purpose of those is to, is to create, uh, there are educational collaboratives uh, throughout the state and, and we're a member of that one. We actually also, at times partner with the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Co you know, Collaborative. Uh, and that's a way to do some, some shared resources uh, and it's helpful in some ways. Um, and, and yet, uh, could we do more? Absolutely, I think we could and it would be nice to, there's some questions around transportation that I, you know, colleagues of mine mentioned, I haven't had a you know, conversation with, with those uh, collaboratives to see if they wanna take that question on, um, particularly around like special education transportation. Um, but I think there's ways we can continue to, to sort of grow and expand those collaborative uh, arrangements that can help us. Um, it, it, it's interesting how different collaboratives focus on sort of different things where they try to do some, some uh, you know, cooperative or efficiencies. Uh, and I think they can, they can like schools get stuck and sort of kind of keep on doing the things they've been doing. And uh, you know, it's important for us and, and other member towns of those collaboratives to, to leverage that structure to, to help us. So I think there's opportunity there. I guess the, uh, the other thing that I had been thinking about is that, uh, as you know, Doug, as you were around and involved in it a little bit at the time, we did have a uh, effort made to look at four town um, combination of the entire K-12 program and we came to the conclusion that we would be much more efficient and much more flexible operation if we were a four town K to 12 district. Uh, also, we know that other towns solve the problem by uh, actually merging districts um, in order to gain efficiency of scale with falling enrollment. And uh, it seems that uh, at some point down the road, uh, people are going to sort of have to face that reality. Uh, but it is a hard one for all because of the tradition that we have of town-based programs and municipal-based programs would have to yield to um, some other goals. So I was curious whether there had been any discussions of those more fundamental structural lines. It certainly crossed my mind. Um, I haven't reached out to anyone to to see if they're ready to have a conversation like that. It's it like you say is a very difficult and oftentimes very emotional um, uh, conversation because of that tradition and that that level of local control that that communities want to have uh, with their schools, particularly their elementary schools. Um, but we're, we're kind of to that place, I think, again, um, you know, I think that 
the last time the, the efficiencies were clear, but the economics weren't painful enough yet. And we may be getting to that place where the, the, the economics are getting sufficiently difficult for all four communities that it makes sense to revisit that conversation and figure out if we can find uh, the right balance uh, and, and the right mechanisms for some, you know, appropriate local influ influence so that people feel that ownership still and yet still meet the requirements of and the efficiencies that you can get from a regional schools. So I'm, again, sort of, I'm open to the ideas and, and happy to start kind of reaching out to folks about that for sure. Thanks, Doug. Kathy? Um, I, I just want to follow up briefly on, uh, on the idea of group action um, for people, districts beyond ours. Um, in my earlier life on trying to think of policy changes, it's helpful to have a specific policy in mind to change um, and recommendations of what to change. And my list of three that are hurting our district are the charter formula, the circuit breaker formula, and chapter 70. I mean, hurting in terms of at the state legislative level without changes there, we're, we're doing what just happened with chapter 70, getting a small bump up that doesn't amount to a lot. So trying to do an analysis with, um, I understand, you know, there's not deep resources in the district in terms of people staffing and on the school committee, but really sitting down and coming up with what exactly. And when I look, and I'll just give an example, chapter 70, um, our percent low income, and, and Bridget and I had a quick discussion on this. It's, it's measured by... Um, school lunch and school breakfast, which are now free, so you don't have to income test to get into those programs, on the welfare program and um, on mass health or the Medicaid program. In Amherst, this may particularly hurt us with the fourth factor because if I'm a, a parent working for an employer like the state um, in town, I may have family coverage and not pull my kid out, even though my income would make me eligible. So I never am means tested for health insurance. So I've been wondering whether we put uh, 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 the housing voucher section eight in as an additional metric that people who are in subsidized housing um, either with a section eight or because that's a means tested program in the same income range. So it's it's a looking at if there was a change that was in the spirit of what the basic law is trying to do. And I looked at I didn't look at circuit breaker, Doug, for the district, but circuit breaker in the elementary, we're losing money on it. Um, you know, you know, it's it's supposed to make us whole, but we don't completely get whole. So the attachment point for the circuit breaker is probably an issue. So it's, it's and then charter, it's clear what's going on in charter. So my, my point is not just to build a group, to build a group around, these are the changes we want, because otherwise every year it's trying to get more money. Um, I, I think I'll just stop there. The other big one um, on in terms of advocacy is there was a millionaire's tax passed and a big chunk was supposed to go to education. It's not coming back to K through 12. A little bit last year, not a little bit, a chunk came back in a very good way for Amherst because it went for capital and it helped bump up the amount our school, our new school is getting from MSBA. But looking forward, so far the legislature is looking at it for junior community college and college debt. And it's not being allocated toward the local schools at all. And that I don't think was the expectation. So it's bringing on a new state obligation rather than fixing the other. So I, I know that's that will be for some of the larger unions, there's a split allegiance here because they also represent the community colleges. I mean, and certainly we would like debt free, but I think trying to think big about some of this and as Andy said, this might not happen next year, but if it gets in the works with a specific piece, the Amherst Town Council can help be supportive if there's something other than saying more dollars, we can be saying, here's how more dollars would flow in a rational way. So th that's my only point on trying to not just think of everyone going in and asking with their ha hat out. And I know 
some of you have been into see Amherst College as well, but it's it's a series of what might they be willing to pay for, whether it's a capital, a one-time capital thing that would give help to the district and would accrue to everyone. And I'll stop there. I am not, I just want to say, I am not as concerned as Mandy often is about how we share small amounts of money, Amherst versus others. You know, I think when we're repairing fields, our DPW is, is buying a piece of equipment they're using on other Amherst fields, not just the middle and high school fields. So some of this just makes sense to me when we're buying grass seed, but I, the big ticket items. And I'm going to end there. But the other piece, if we go to six, we need the town manager to give us options on where to go to for six. Um, the one time we weren't equal recently to go back to Bridges, when we added the Cress apartment, department and we brought in firefighters, the municipal budget got a one-time bump up to accommodate an expansion of a function. Um, but it was a one-time. And as Andy said, every year since then, it's other than the amount that goes for capital. So there was a, a staff, a kind of staff, a type of staff. We opened up a new department um, and it was a one-time book. And we eased in with ARPA money, but then we absorbed it into our budget. So there was, Andy, there was one exception over the time we've been in the council to exactly the same. So I'll, I'll stop there, but we, we will need to have a discussion with the town manager of going to six, where's the money coming from? Okay, I want to go to Bernie and uh, Councilor Haneke, and then it's it's 308. So I want to move on to the uh, elementary schools. So Bernie? Yeah, let me try and be brief um, and say this quickly. I think one, uh, Kathy is right on target. I would abandon the rural um, focus um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Pick some issues that will allow you to broaden your base and broaden the electorate. So if you focused on, say, the, the charter formula, you're going to find that there are towns and cities all across Massachusetts that have problems with the, tar uh, the, the charter formula. And that becomes a movement, not, well, we're small and we're poor. Let's focus on issues that affect a broader population. Um, I would say that if you look at what percentage of the town's funding goes to schools, um, that's a poor measure. You look at the towns in Franklin County and 75% of their budget goes to their schools. Um, that's because they don't have a lot of other things going on. You look at cities and you'll find that less than 50% of their budget may go to the schools, but that's because they've got a lot of other things going on. So that's not an accurate way of looking at it. If you wanna look at, again, DESE data, um, we spend about 20 percent more than average on the regional school, and we spend about I think thirty percent more than average on the elementary school. So our per pupil expenditures relative to the rest of the work are pretty robust. And I'm not saying we need to change those, but just acknowledge that that happens. Uh, one of our former counselors a budget year or so ago made the remark that our elementary school's cost is about the same as Bement for a day student. Um, so that's, <laughs> you know, that's a measure. Um, I would also uh, uh, <clears throat> look at uh, 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 I would be careful about and having been in two towns, admittedly smaller towns, that were hosts to regional schools. There's a lot of interaction between the host town and the regional school. And I don't know, and I would agree with the observation that there's not a lot of budget savings in there. There's a lot of good guy stuff that happens. Um, there's a lot of sharing, uh, but it's it, you, you're building a trust and you're building a working relationship. And oftentimes that's fostered by the employees not by the leadership. So I'll just let it go with that. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, uh, Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, one thing that actually kind of bridges both budgets um, in a sense, um, but I, I do want to second what Bernie said about um, comparison of budgets, especially towards much smaller rural towns. Um, but my question is the Comandantes program in the elementary school is working its way up to the first class being fifth or I think they're fourth graders this year. Um, what is the plan when they hit middle school? 
Are they going to lose languages for two years before they get to high school? What has the school, the school committee and the region as administration done to plan for that? Because that might not be next fiscal year, but it might be the one after that. I'm not sure if I've got my years right, but, but where's that in the planning too? And how is that going to affect the conversations that need to happen? So I can I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's it is a definite uh, question that we need to address and 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 are aware of, um, particularly with the sixth grade moving. Um, you know, it it's where it gets tricky is to extend that dual language program into the region, because you know uh, what's fair and equitable for our regional partners in that regard. If they didn't have access to the program, they can't join the program. But then if the cost is borne by the region. There's an inequity there. So we've got to think about either if we want to continue a, a dual language program through, say, all the way through the high school. And I'm not saying we do or don't. I'm just saying just thinking about the, the sort of financial components. We've got, to have a, uh, we've got to find a way, if that were to be the case, that we're um, either offering opportunity for the other towns to participate previous to them getting to the seventh grade or uh, carving out that cost somehow that seems fair Um because, you know, if only Amherst kids or kids that went to Amherst elementary schools are eligible to continue in a, in a dual language program, you know, you've, you're, you're, again, excluding some kids from, from access and yet charging everybody for the cost. So we, we've got to think about how that works and whether and how we do that, uh, how we marry that in. I think that there's a critical question, independent of sort of dual language programs, like, well, how do we, you know, we've got kids that are, you know, hopefully fully bilingual. As sixth graders, how do we continue to support them? Uh, whether it's a dual language program or otherwise, how do we support them academically around that language um, in in their secondary uh, progression? So those are all questions we've got to we've got to kind of think through and think through the equity questions um, about that as as well. So you know it's on the you know it's on the uh, things we've got to consider and got to get figured out and and you know we've we've really got about two years to do that, but that coincides with a whole host of things that are coming in a couple of years. So it's it's in that mix of, of totality of things to, to consider. Okay, thanks. Um, anything else on the regional schools? Okay, why don't we move on, Kathy, move on to the elementary schools. Thank you all. I'm gonna pop off. Okay. <laughs> Not a little okay. school person. <laughs> Thank you. So Doug, I, I sent you a much longer list on the elementary school. So instead of reading out all of them, I'll just touch what I think are some of the big ones. And Mandy, Mandy asked one of them on the sixth grade move. Um, one is, I might have missed it, but I didn't see a, a revenue table. Um, so I, in the, the posted bu budget, so... I just wanted to see how this year is financed. And the question was, I think there's $400,000 of ESSER money holding up this year, uh, but I wasn't sure. So that's just a question. Um, and, and then the introduction, so going with this, since I couldn't find a revenue page, I couldn't see what you're looking forward. There's a sentence that says, over the next couple of years, current economic circumstances may require the district to lean on non-recurring revenue to support the budget. Didn't know what that meant, you know, on what non-recurring revenue <laughs> coming from where um, and how much of a gap. So for the regional, for the district uh, middle, you did a look ahead kind of budget to show revenues versus expenses. Um, so since I couldn't find it for FY25, I clearly wasn't gonna find it for FY26 or 27 either. And so I don't know how much thinking is going into FY26 is this middle year before the new school is open, but in FY27, we're going down from three to two schools. And so whether there's been some, I'm, I know there has been so, but some thinking as we're looking at that on what happens to the total budget as we go down to one fewer school that we're operating. And, and, and just so everyone knows in the, when we 
applied for the money from MSBA, the funding organization for schools. We had to do a pro forma table on this. So we, we there there was an exercise done on, on talking about it. And clearly there's utility savings because it's a net zero school. So it was trying to think of, you know, are we in, so I was particularly worried about next year, FY26, you know, are we in trouble with where revenue is going? Because as everyone knows, the, the, the elementary school seems to be right on target for the guidelines. It's at 4%. So we're not dealing with needing more money for it. Um, and I asked my question um, for the district uh, about the sixth grade move up, but do we have any... Um, more thinking, and I just think this could be a future conversation because to to what extent as the sixth grade moves up, are they taking some of the ELL art music costs that are in the elementary school, are those disappearing? And are there economies of scale when they move up to the, the district? And Mandy just asked the one on Comenantes. So I did have a question on the Comenantes program on the budgets. I see we lost a grant. Um, and it was a couple hundred thousand dollars if I look at the two different lines. I was curious on what happened there and why didn't why didn't we keep getting that? Um, so I and then I'm trying to do the the biggies. You know, in this one, enrollment is down and um, staffing is up, Bernie. So it's not quite the it's all equal. But one of the issues on enrollment is I looked at school choice. And in the past, when we looked at school choice, we kind of break, broke even. It looks like we're not breaking even on school choice when I looked at one of the how much it brings in and how much it costs us. So is there a point at which we're not open and does that help us or not? Um, would we decide not to be open when we're consolidating? I didn't find anything on the charter school, so I just looked it up, and we, we we're spending about one point six million leaving us um, on the charter school, and most of my others then go with because I couldn't find a revenue source. I wasn't quite sure how we were achieving the four percent, um, and I couldn't see these different pieces. So that's it, and I would like to post these, Bob, um, once we're through with this, because I did go back to do number of students and sta staffing st staffing came out of the the um, document that we have, just so people can see what I'm seeing on the enrollment versus the staff. I put a table in, so mm -hmm. the questions are there, but just so people don't have to go and look at it. That's it for the biggies. There were more on the, and circuit mm -hmm. breakers, so $200,000 loss. So I was going through, you know, things that are hurt, hurting us. Um, but since you're at 4%, it's it's a next year kind of problem as well as what, where did we, how did we lose that Comenantes grant? And can we get it back? Right. So um, a few things I'll say. So part of the reason why there's not a revenue section of the elementary budget is because almost everything relative to revenue is is in the town's budget. So the things that are sort of pluses and minuses in like the regional budget, um, so there's no transportation reimbursement, but most of the rest of the other things are, are revenues uh, that go directly to the, to the town. And so chapter 70 goes directly to the town. Um, uh, you know, other, uh, other revenues like, and, and expenses are charged directly to town. So circuit break, not circuit break, I'm sorry, uh, charter expenses are, are handled in the town. And so you have to think of it Kind of in the same way that like chapter 90 goes to the town and then the budget for for the dpw is inclusive of that but not exclusively just that um so you know there's there's a similarity there i think in some respects it is also difficult because some of the things that you think of in terms of kind of revenue are are things like grants so the four hundred thousand is the right number for for esser funding support in fiscal 25. um you think about school choice um those are technically partly because of our auditors told us that they can't be counted as revenues. Uh, school choice is considered an offset, which is an interesting thing. Um, we generally do take in more money than we send out. Um, the, the thing we have there is we usually have about 90 kids that come into Amherst. I was just looking recently, 90, 95 is kind of the neighborhood of how many inbound kids we have for school choice. We send out about 50 or so. Um, the very large number of those go to Pelham. 
Um, that's a short story on that. So, so uh, and and the cost for for school choice is five thousand per student. And then if you if the student incurs uh, special education costs, those are claimed by the, the the district that that provides those service and billed directly to us as as a cost. And so all that stuff happens on the on the cherry sheet. Because Chapter 70 is considered an offset, it, it can't be counted as revenue, which is kind of a quirky thing. And it's always hard to sort of represent that well on our budgets. What we do is when we use our school choice revenue in our budget, we reduce an expense, um, typically classroom teachers. But but we really should and will probably start to shift some of that into special education because some of that revenue that we're generating there is 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 truly to support uh, staff and, and services for kids that have special education needs. Um, uh, so that's part of it. So the, you know, sort of the revenue is, is, you know, the line item that you guys vote for elementary schools. That's, you know, most of it, uh, as far as appropriation, that's, that's what we have. Um, we are using for the coming year, about $750,000 in school choice. That's up a little bit. Um, we intentionally, like I said, with, with the region, we've, we've used less school choice the last couple of years in order to build balance so that we're, we can leverage more of that in the coming year. So we're trying to taper our, 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 our uh, dependence on the ESSER funding a little bit. Um, there's, you know, there's some limits to that and there's only so much resource there, but, you know, we'd bring in about $700,000 and, you know, in, of, 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 um, of uh, school choice revenue. And we're using more than that this coming year, but that's part of why we sort of build a balance. And then good years, we use uh, less and we use more in, in years that are a little tougher. Um, but I do think yes, next year for fiscal twenty six, it'll be a tougher year because uh, again, that four hundred thousand of 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 ESSER support that's in there, uh, kind of reducing our expenses, will hit in full, um, and so that's a that's a concern. Um, there are other things that I wanted to make sure to touch on. Oh, the uh, the Comandantes grant. This uh, this so we've been fortunate to get that support and help us build our program. The state shifted what they wanted to fund and how they wanted to fund. Some of it's because we're a more mature program. Uh, they wanted to support some programs that are getting started. Um, so that's part of the shift there. And that's, you know, and, and with grant funding like that, you know, it's it's generally what they call non-supplanting. So we really aren't supporting like teacher salaries. You know, does it help tremendously to get, you know, instructional materials and, and uh, do other kinds of support for the program? Absolutely. Um, and so, it, you know, it is, it is hard when we, when we lose that, but that's, that is the the difficulty, uh, you know. Sometimes with grants, is how to how to taper off of them and to have that sort of that that you know significant drop is going to be a trickier you know trickier bit for us as far as that's concerned. But hopefully, the support we've gotten over the last few years of built curriculum materials uh, in a way that we can we can you know um, bear that burden without without too 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 much difficulty. Um, I think the the uh, on the circuit breaker question, it's really dependent upon. Um, on the kids we have, so it's a reimbursement. Um, so the way circuit breaker, just a quick you know thing on how circuit breaker works is if you have extraordinary expense in special education for students, um, you can get some state relief uh, as far as carrying that cost. So there's a, a sort of foundation level that the state identifies, kind of statewide, and then it's four times that number, and then your expenses have to be above that multiplier which right now is in the upper 40,000 range. So you have to carry the cost up to that point, 100% is on you. Once you get above that, then you're, you have eligible costs that can be reimbursed um, and include both you know, services as well as transportation costs. Um, the state has, uh, and, and the transportation costs are new in the last couple of years. Um, what that funding for transportation costs has done is they fund the expenses first. So in the past, Circuit breaker wouldn't always, those eligible costs, which are above that threshold, weren't always funded at 100%. So by adding the transportation in, uh, they've done a much better job of covering those, those uh, uh, special education costs above threshold at 100%. And then what's sort of left over in the appropriation from the, from the legislature is used to fund transportation. So they've done a much better job of covering circuit breaker costs. But again, the burden on on local districts is you know is that four times foundation, which is like I said, just shy of fifty grand that you have to carry. And if your kids cost that less than that, you're just on the hook for the whole thing. And only once you get above that is some of it reimbursable. Um, 
Uh, and so the, the drop you see is really about students. So, so some of the students that, you know, sort of incur costs of a, of a significant nature are kids without a district placement. So we do a lot of programming to keep kids in district. That lowers costs significantly. Um, but we've had some kids out of district in the last few years. We had a drop in census of out of district kids. So that is part of the available funding drop then because they reimbursed us for those that were eligible. And, and we'll probably see that kind of uptick again next year. So it, it varies a bit from one year to the next. Um, you know, it, it, it often runs a bit steady. Uh, the elementary sees more jumps in that, in that circuit breaker, because if you go from three kids that are out of district to four and then back to three, you know, you sort of notice those kind of changes a bit more significantly, um, from one year to the next at the regional level, just as a sort of paint that picture, the, the number of students that are in out of district tend to be a bit more steady. So the reimbursement for circuit breaker tends to be a bit more steady. And so it, it doesn't have quite the same uh, volatility in, in outcome there. Um, I think on some of the other questions, just as far as looking looking ahead, I mean, I think on the on the questions of, of, of shared staff, I mean, obviously, if we move to sixth grade, we're going to try to leverage staff to be as efficient as we can. Um, you know, so EL staff uh, language gets a little tricky because of, of, of um, you know how it how it fits into the regional program of studies, uh, but uh, you know any and all places we can we can leverage efficiencies and economies of scale. We will whether it'll be, I think it'll be difficult to have sixth graders in classes with seventh and eighth graders, but we'll have to see what we can do. And uh, given that they are two distinct districts, can we have you know mixed classes that make sense? And and that has uh, you know and when I say makes sense, I mean in a number of ways. Well, whether the folks at Desi are okay with it, whether the you know sort of families are are okay with it whether we as a, as a professional staff are okay with it. So all of those are, are part and parcel of planning as we move ahead. Um, but I think there's opportunity, even, even if we don't commingle sixth graders into some of these kind of classes, I think there's opportunities to, to leverage staff in an efficient way that can be cost effective for, for both districts really, um, which, is, which is helpful. Um, I think if there's another thing that you mentioned. Oh, on the other thing I will keep uh, let you know relative to that staff budget document and the, and the FTEs there, it, it does include um, staff that are funded from appropriation as well as staff that are funded from grant. It's not all grant funded staff, but it's some of the, the more steady ones, uh, entitlement type grants mostly, but we've got our ESSER funds on there too. So that can kind of over count. I don't want to say over count, but it, it can count staff that are um, maybe uh, temporarily added by virtue of some grant funding availability. Um, we try not to show those kind of things too, too much, but the ESSER has definitely been in there a little bit. Um, and I think that that, that number is dropping by about three or more than three people for fiscal 25. So that's a piece to keep in mind on that, on that staffing level piece is it, it does show some of the, the um, staffing from other sources. So food service, for example, is an example of, uh, that's fairly steady, but it's, you know, those staff aren't, aren't on the appropriated, you know, sort of cost of, of things to the town. So that's not a, not a big thing, one or the other, but it's, it's, it's a piece to note in the, in the analysis as you look at those a little bit. Um, I do think just back to your other broad question, just sort of what does this look like in, in out years? We're in process. Uh, you know, I had some we were fortunate before the region meeting recently to to look at some out years as far as projections and planning. We've we're, we're in process on that a little bit with the Amherst ones. We want to do the similar kind of thing, but but I think some of the things that we learned from from looking at the region one, you know, about sort of what are our cost drivers, what is the sort of increase year over year in our expenses, that kind of thing is going to be um, very very similar. I think on on the sort of revenue side for Amherst, I, I mean, I think generally, you know, three, three and a half percent is typically the, the increase from one year to the next most of the year. So again, we have a bit of a gap between uh, our available revenues and our available expenses. So I think, you know, 26 is going to be a tough year because I think we're going to be in that space before we get to a new building in the sixth grade move. Once we, we move to a new building in, in the sixth grade move, um, I think there's a, a series of efficiencies we gain that will help us out over a, a few years to to sustain ourselves in a in a pretty uh, meaningful way. But I think that you know as soon as we do that planning, then I think we need to immediately start thinking. Well, 
what's our longer term sort of strategy around, you know, expense versus, versus revenue and, you know, what are our enrollments doing? Are they going to hold steady? Is school choice still the right choice for us? Um, et cetera. So hopefully that got to most things, at least a little bit. I, I, th I think you got to most of them and I see Mandy's hand is up, but just on school choice, um, do you, when do you announce we're open for it or not? Um, it, it, is that, is that like in June of the year before and then you're open? And I know once once a once a student's in, if the parents want to keep them in, they're in. Um, so it's a yeah. Yeah. So when we when we do school choice, so we um, every district is by default a school choice district. So you have to tell the state that you're not um, and you have to do that by June 1st. Um, we have remained that way. Now, even if you are a school choice district, you can decide that you don't have any openings. Um, so we evaluate and project what we think we're seeing in each of our buildings for each of the classes and do we have capacity uh that's you know for a given grade level uh to to carry another student or two or whatever it is and and we intentionally um keep in mind you know the potential for students to be added over the course of the summer so if, if our sort of class size that we want is i'm going to pick a number 22 and we've got 20 kids in the class, we might not add any school choice students to that. If on the other hand, we've got 22 and we've got 18 in the class, we might open one or two spots. Um, so we're trying to, you know, leave some capacity for kids to move in and, and be a part of our district, um, but then open slots that don't add to expense. So we're, we're trying to strike that balance. Um, we'll go through our enrollments here in June, uh, make determinations about how many actual seats there are? The lottery is actually in the month of June for for uh, for school choice, so that we can notify families accordingly if 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 we've got spots available. Um, but it's really building by building and 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 grade by grade that we look at that and see how many seats that we have uh, potential for. Um, okay. Now you know we in in prior years in finance when Mike was doing this, the um, adding one more person to a class that is very low in enrollment didn't bring much operating costs. So it makes total mm -hmm. sense. It's when you're, mm -hmm. it's when you're looking to squeeze down the size of total enrollment that you start thinking, you know, so that's why I asked it in the context of going to a consolidated school where, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to cede the floor to Mandy. And I, I understand now what you're saying about revenues, but without seeing that, we get this much money from the town, this much from Chapter 70, and we're plugging a hole with 400000 of ESSER. I don't care how you do it, but it's it was detective work to try to figure out um, what the hole was and thinking about what does FY26 look like, that you know, ESSER's gone, and this other non-recurring mystery funds, it's good to know there might be some, so yeah. I did want to comment on that, that that was a, that sentence that was in that narrative at the beginning of the budget book. Um, I didn't realize got left. It really was the sigil in some respects. It's from last year. So if you think about last year and the fact that we had ESSER money for this year next, that's where the couple of years part comes in um, okay. and not the current part. I think that it's it's really, you know, there there are some things that kind of fall into that category, but it's not quite as fair a statement as it was a year ago. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. That's that's okay. We'll 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 delete that sentence. Thanks. Yes, Councilor Haneke. Yeah, two two questions. One of which is a follow up to the multi year budgeting plan. Um, you know, you provided a very very basic one for the region that showed us a lot of structural issues with a region budget in the last couple weeks. Um, we haven't seen a multi year plan for the elementary school, and I I listened to your answer, but I guess my question is. When we see one for an elementary school, given the consolidating of schools, are we going to get one that is just as basic that doesn't include those considerations? So everything's, you know, planned out with a level services without any consolidation thought at all? Or will we be getting one that, um, and particularly, you know, next year when we think we might have a rough elementary year, the council, at least I as a counselor, I'm going to want 
a multi-year plan that is a thought out multi-year plan that includes thinking about, oh, well, utilities aren't going to go up 10% because they might go down to zero or something because of this, no, they won't go down fully to zero. Um, you know, and and thought out about, well, what are our personnel savings by consolidating the schools? Because at least when the elementary school building committee was formed and all of those applications went in, there was projected personnel savings too. So so I guess I'm I, I want to know that when we see a projection next year in case we have a bad year that that projection will have those numbers already included including how much personnel we expect to save how much utilities have been saved and things like that uh that so that's sort of a follow-up to the multi-year question one question two um when you're looking at choice seats especially since we are consolidating schools in two years have you projected out do you project out the need or potential problem with offering choice student seats now where there might be an opening in Wildwood or Fort River now or in both, but given the intention to consolidate and reap those efficiencies of larger student numbers in a school and all where you might be able to eliminate a classroom in a grade because you can better be efficient was is those are are those when the school opens projected out so that now you're not potentially you're saying potentially you know we don't have seats now because if we accept them now it increases our costs in two years when we consolidate schools or have you not even thought about that so i don't know how much that was factored in in, in opening school choice seats in in the past few years i mean it's obviously a piece that we do need to consider as we move forward um, as to how much you know uh, capacity we have and what efficiency we can get, we can gain, I think that there are um, you know in, in and I'd have to go back and look at sort of the the predictive work that was done in in the school building project around some of this too. So I think they were probably carrying forward most of the school choice kids. But that's that's just it. Is like it, it, you know does uh, does the number of school choice seats makes still make sense when we collapse from three buildings to two, right? Um, so we're going to have to look at that. And and some, you know, anybody that we've got, you know, sort of on the books now is going to be grandfathered in and, and be carried forward. But so we're going to have to think about that as we make choices of, of, of allowing or not allowing folks in for school choice. Um, back to your original question about projecting out in the coming, uh, coming years and thinking about it, it's like, um, yeah, we may by just simplicity start with a with you know status quo as if we're not getting a new building, but of course that's not a terribly helpful projection because it's um, it's not the reality that's going to be on the ground. You know that's just not it. And so to to look at 27, which is the first year with with a new building on on in the mix, and and uh, and the impact that will also happen with sixth grade moving is is going to be part of what we have to try to try to figure out at least in the broadest way and, and we'll probably lean uh, at this point in time on some of those projections that were made a few years ago we'll we'll you know as far as what kind of you know conservation of staff that happens when you when you get more efficient that way um but we'll we'll review them because some things uh you know we have actual enrollments if, you know as opposed to projected enrollments so we have some some greater sense of how many students we have and and uh and we're a lot closer, so the, the the numbers of kids is a little more well known than it was. So, you know, I think all of those are factors that we're going to try to capture as best we can, because um, I think there's there there are significant opportunities um, for efficiency when you when you sort of collapse from three to two, um, and we'll be conservative in those estimates. You know, I think if you go back far enough, and and you know, when we close Marks Meadow. Uh, back in 2009, I think it was fiscal, I can't remember if it was fiscal nine or fiscal 10, you know, we made estimates of what that would save. It actually ended up saving more than that because we were very cautious about our projecting of that. And we'll do the same thing here. So, um, yeah, I think fiscal 26 is going to be the hard year because it'll be before we make those shifts. And then, um, and then there'll be, you know, uh, significant factors to consider. You know, we'll have fewer administrators. We'll have fewer classroom teachers. We'll have fewer 
all sorts of things, interventionists, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to think about those and, and work through the models. And in the short term, some of that will be very broadly guessed at. And, and part of the work that we're getting underway is to start to, to dig into those, um, you know, that planning and, and approach to how do we think about that more concretely? Because we really have to, within, you know, not too terribly long, start to really make and get to decision points about, well, how much and what's the model and does it change much and what ways does it change and how many staff are necessary to, to fit that model? Um, and then what's that all cost? You know, um, so those things are going to, uh, are getting underway now. And, and we'll, like I said, we'll probably do a, a rougher cut in the very short term around some of the financials, just to start, you know, getting sort of the order of magnitude of things. Um, and then as we refine our planning, we'll, we'll refine those, those financial estimates as well. Any other questions on the elementary schools? Okay, I think uh, we'll close our discussion of that. And um, I did say that I would have a, uh, a, I would push public comment to the end of the meeting. So uh, I'm now gonna open up for public comment. Uh, if you are in the audience and you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand. I see two people um, with hands raised. Um, so uh, Athena, why don't we, Give each person three minutes and we'll bring them in, please. Okay, is it okay to thank Doug and Sarah, but um, I'm sorry, Doug and Bridget and let them go? Because we Absolutely. won't be coming back to this, right? To. If you thank want you. to, you're welcome to listen to public comment. But. <laughs> thank you both for being here. Okay, here's Deb Leonard. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the forum. I just really wanted to weigh in on uh, Councillor Haneke's question about what air we're doing to move forward, because there's a lot of directions. Um, I do think there's a little bit of wiggle room for this um, upcoming uh, year. There's some amendments that I think could use some support in the in the Senate budget. One is um, increasing rural aid. Another is increasing circuit breaker for tuition and um, transportation. I don't know how much of these are long shots, but there's also one related to another rural transportation one. So there's there's some hope for some budget relief. I I know. Um, our Senator Comerford was planning on really leaning hard on the Senate floor on, I think it was rural transportation, um, and also very interested in um, really getting enough momentum behind opening up Chapter 70. Um, th th we were told at the Dan Hill on Monday, last Monday, that we need about 10 senators to really get that going from the House Ways and Means Committee. So part of the work, I think, at a, at a, Nash at a statewide level is um, lining those people up. There is movement um, amongst uh, the districts in Western Massachusetts to consolidate our efforts and their advocacy. Um, uh, in particular with respect to the, uh, what's the point of having a commission and ignoring their recommendations for the rural aid, but also in terms of transportation in particular, Kathy, I wanted to add that to your list of four things that's really, really hurting us because it's, it's a, it's huge. Um, and in fact, one of the people talked about, um, looking into why, uh, there's the transpa transportation costs are so high and why there are so few bids, why we're sort of being held hostage to the one bid transportation company. Um, there's also um, discussion about, you know, the, the, the Student Opportunities Act was developed as a result of yet another class action suit. Those people withdrew their they're still watching and there's still a lot of talk about how chapter 70 funding is not meeting um, the needs of the majority of districts. Two thirds of the districts are at minimum aid this year. And um, Dan Carey said that that message has been heard loud and clear. 
So um, in an election year, there's also an interest in lining up uh, represented representatives in Western Massachusetts and senators that can put that forward in a way that's going to work because and, and I think that's a nice opportunity for all of us to work together, everybody in, in town, our educators, all members, elected members, our community members, and um, perhaps our, our um, educational institutions, UMass and, and Amherst College can work together to see if we can get them to open up a little bit more about that. One of the, one of the groups that I've started working with is talking about putting together um, an amendment around uh, chap uh, charter school reimbursement. So that's, that's again, I'm not sure how long these things take time to do, but we're definitely looking at ways in which we can uh, work together with other people in the same position um, to, 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 to make that happen. The, um, the or original recommendation for the uh, rural schools transportation was 60 million. Um, and then the governor knocked that down to seven and a half. So, but there's 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 hope that we're going to get up to seventeen and a half. Um, it's hard to figure out as as you all notice how to tease out how much that translates into dollars for a district. But that will be FY twenty five. And then um, you know, there, there's I took a lot of notes. Um, I do feel like we have a roadmap going forward. We, we really, six of the nine of us are brand new to this, but um, we do have a five point uh, promising practices guidelines for developing school budgets. And I think we can start to implement them all, all at the same time, at least as, as Bridget mentioned in terms of creating a group that, um, <laughs> really digs into the details of our budgeting, um, the, the, the budgeting process, funding, tracking, resource management, and anal analysis. I mean, I do think we have um, direction on where to go from where we are now. Um, so I guess Another thing I think we really need to talk about is in the issue of transparency, being open and honest with our community about what we can afford and what we can't afford. And if we want to uh, have the same kind of in uh, same kind of programming available, what that is going to cost the town. So, um, and I'm not saying that we need to keep increasing at a rate we can't afford, but I do think it's really important not to spring this on anybody, on our parents, on our families, to let them know that we need to move in a district in a direction that's financially manageable for everyone and what that would look like without a prop two and a half override. I guess the last part is, uh, I'm sorry, Bernie, but that the net comparison is just totally not fair. They do not provide the same level of ELL services, SPED services. They don't have unionized teachers. That that, that it, you can you could, that's like that's like muffins to donuts. I mean, it's it, it's similar, but it's really just not the same. So, and then you know, Bridge has been really focused on infrastructure, and you know seeing the consolidation and hopefully getting some budget relief for the consolidation of the buildings in the elementary school district, taking a long, hard look at all the things you mentioned, you know, school choice, um, moving the sixth grade, what that looks like, what maintaining the building looks like. Am I running? I, I'm sure I'm, I'm out of my three You're minutes. over, but thank you. Okay. Well, I just want to wrap up with really looking at hard at infrastructure and finding ways of lowering our per pupil costs by getting some budgetary relief that provides a, a differential, but a non-trivial differential cost in reimburse in what we send to charter schools. If we can get that per pupil cost down by taking certain parts of our operating budget by reducing that, then then that, that has a little bit of a, a ripple effect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Could you bring Sarah in, please? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. 
Great. Um, I'll be quick. I also wanted to push back on that foment comparison. Very unfair. Uh, I'll just remind all listeners that public schools have to accept every child, no matter what that child's needs are, and meet those needs. Um, I don't think Bement is under the same obligation. So um, I, I, I hope I don't hear that one again. Um, as for uh, savings, when uh, we open the new school, I certainly hope there will, will be some. But remember that we may be dropping a school, but we will still be educating elementary students at three locations because we'll have sixth grade at the middle school. So we haven't talked about it in any detail yet, but I could imagine that some of the staff that are not needed at the new school might be moved to this sixth grade academy. I don't know, but we have to, we have yet to find out how many teachers and administrators we need for that sixth grade academy, but, but maybe we'll, we'll have them <laughs> at the time. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that while Doug is, and others in the central office and all the building principals have been doing a heroic job, we have basically been in crisis mode for years now. And so much of this, um, so much of what everybody wants, uh, I feel is just waiting for a new superintendent and knock wood that <laughs> that happens um, as as we hope, July 1st, um, uh, that superintendent will have a mountain of, mountain of um, issues on, on her desk, but uh, there'll be more support at that point. Doug can go back to doing maybe only two jobs instead of three or four, um, and we'll be able to focus on the paths ahead. Um, I'll leave it at that. I thank you all for your attention to these school budgets. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Tony, you want to come in? Hi, thanks. Yeah, Tony Cunningham, uh, live in North Amherst. Um, I understand the hesitation to give another three hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars to the regional schools in the FY twenty-five budget, and I understand the con the concern about where that money would come from. I just want to put it in context. Uh, this money is less than a third of the money budgeted in FY25 for the library expansion project debt. It's less than the money that has been spent on the library project for design and project management this year. And should the expansion project not move ahead, um, that money will be freed up. It won't be needed in FY25 to pay debt on significant borrowings for the library. There may be smaller borrowings for a scaled back renovation, but they certainly won't be, you know, more than $20 million. Um, so I would encourage you to approve the six, recommend an approval of the 6% and uh, look to the capital budget for the funding. I, I think the difference between 10% and 10.5% is somewhere in the region of this amount also, this 355,000. So if we were to give 10% of property tax levy to the capital budget, that money would also be freed up. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Tony. Any other uh, comments? Okay, I don't see any hands, so I will close public comment. Uh, anyone else have any final words or final issues to talk about? Kathy? Um, yeah, one is scheduling, and I didn't see whether we closed the loop. This coming Friday, the elementary school building committee meets from 8.30 to 10.30, and the meeting is likely to go the two hours. It's always possible we'd end earlier. Both Alicia and I are in that meeting, and, Alyssa, and um, as is Paul Bachman, and uh, at least one finance person. So if... We could start at 1030, then I won't miss the first half hour. I can't miss, I can't leave early. I'm the chair of the committee. So that's a pure scheduling issue, yeah, whether we, <laughs> whether I've asked, we. I've asked Athena to, to push the meeting to start back to 1030. Okay. 
or time. That, that's, that's great. And, you know, I raised this way back when, but I was hoping we wouldn't have a Friday meeting. So it was one of these. <laughs> By the way, I can do all Fridays, but that one. Um, I think, so I think, then, yeah. I think we so can be flexible. So then the second issue is I didn't make it in my education, uh, elementary or other issues on where the money might come from for 6%. I want mm -hmm. to make sure we have that schedule, Bob, on our internal. Um, you know, we, we heard one public comment, but just uh, it will be much easier for finance to make a recommendation if we know there's a source of money. Um, you know, I'm I'm prepared to go to 6%, but in any case, we're going to have to figure out where it comes because the, we have, we're looking at a balanced budget in the budget book. So, yeah. and that's got to come from some combination of Pop, Bob, of uh, Paul and Sandy Pooler. So somewhere in our scheduling um, that we carve out a piece of time for that was the other thing about scheduling. Yeah, we're, well, I'm, I'm aware of that. And I think, I think the town manager will uh, have something for us at some point. And it just the something for us at some point has to be before we write our, re our report with recommendations. <laughs> to the I don't know what it works. There, there's, there's an end date on the something for us at some time. Yeah. I, I, I recognize that. Athena, did you want to? Um, also not on our agenda plan yet is the uh, adoption of optional tax exemptions that we're hoping the council will vote in June and then coming to the committee on May 20 will be the water and sewer rates. So we'll just need to work those in um, for the council to vote on those in June. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think we'll need action that quickly. I need to check with um, Jen LaFountain our treasurer to make sure that if we vote, if the council votes after June 3rd council meeting, um, that she'll be able to do the water and sewer rate bills for the quarter. Last year we voted around June 4 and um, this year, the next meeting after that is the 17th. So I just need to check on timing. Otherwise I'll ask the committee to take that up a little bit earlier. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, just let us know when we need to take it up. Okay. And Kathy? And Athena, could you find out, not necessarily for discussion, but I can't remember when we can see third quarter of the current year. I think we're at that time point. It would be nice if we, if it's available to just put it in the packet so we could look at how is the current year doing as of, you know, with all but uh, six weeks left of the year. You know, so, you know, in terms of, I know we don't get fourth quarter until the end of the summer or early September, but just it. I find that useful because it shows me how we've been budgeting and where the potential surplus is um, each year. Okay. Um, it, uh, Holly is out this week, but I will ask her for that when she returns. It's not going to be this Friday, um, but I'll, yeah. I'll see if we can, if we can get that report to you the following week. And then and one I, other quick, sorry, go ahead. And I just want to say, it's not necessary for a presentation, but at some point we'd have to have it because I think most of us can read through it. I'm just really looking at how we're doing. You know, sure, so I understand. Yeah. It's not her time as much as our time. So we have it while we're thinking of the budget. That'd be great. Well, during the meeting. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and then another quick note, we have um, on Monday, the public forum on the appropriation for the fire truck scheduled for 6.30. So we've asked the, that will be a, public forum for the council and the finance committee, and you'll have an opportunity to reconsider your recommendation after the public forum before the council votes on the appropriation order. And then on um, the 21st, the very next day, we have the public hearing on the budget at 6.30, and that's virtual. The meeting on Monday, um, Bernie and Matt, you're welcome to attend in person or online. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, do I have a motion for to adjourn? So moved. I second. Okay. Yes. We need to vote on it. I'm an I, Kathy. Yes. Andy? Yes. Uh, Councilor yes. Hanke? I. Bernie? Yes. All right. I, th I think uh, Alicia's dropped out. Um, okay. Well, then we're adjourned at 4 1 p.m. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.